Welcome to the candidate debate for the 19th, 19th House District in the Connecticut General Assembly, sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Greater Hartford and WHC-TV. We are pleased to bring you this nonpartisan voter service for the 2016 election with the cooperation of the respective parties. I'm Libby Sweetek of the League of Women Voters Greater Hartford and will serve as the moderator of this debate. Tonight's debate will be conducted in a modified cumulative time format. Each candidate will have 10 minutes total for the question and rebuttal portion of the debate. They will also have two minutes each for the closing uh, statement section of this debate. When speaking, each candidate will be timed by a member of the League of Women Voters of Greater Hartford. They will be uh, apprised of their time as they proceed. Um, order of response was determined before the debate, and let me introduce the candidates now. Chris Barnes is currently serving his second term on the West Hartford Town Council, and he is running to represent the 19th District in the Connecticut General Assembly. Chris and his wife, Stephanie, have lived in West Hartford for 20 years, and they have three teenage daughters. Chris has served on the town's Risk Management Advisory Board, coached youth sports, volunteered for and supported a number of local charities in town, and currently serves as a mentor and volunteer in the West Hartford Public School System. In addition to his volunteer activities, Chris is a partner with the law firm of Reardon, Scanlon, Fadola, Barnes in West Hartford. The firm represents insurance industry clients and other commercial entities in litigation and regulatory manners around the country. Derek Slapp and his wife Alex, his high school sweetheart, moved to West Hartford for the great public schools and quality of life. They have three children, a preschooler and two daughters, ages 10 and 11, who walk to their neighborhood schools. Derek and his family are active in the community. Derek has coached soccer, and his wife plays flute with the West Hartford Symphony Orchestra. Derek earned his undergraduate degree from Syracuse University, and later an MBA from UConn. He has spent more than 20 years in journalism and public service. Derek was a news anchor and reporter at NBC 30, and then worked as a public servant in local and state government most recently as Chief of Staff for the State Democrats. He is currently the Associate Vice President of External Relations at the Yukon Foundation and a lecturer in the Political Science Department at Yale University. Welcome to our candidates. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, um, order of response was chosen earlier. Chris is going to start with the first question. Um, this is an open seat. The 19th District is an open seat. Uh, so they will each, neither has the uh, um, benefit of being the incumbent. Chris, what are your top three legislative priorities for the upcoming session? Well, thank you, Libby. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Thanks to the League of Women Voters and to, to West Hartford Television and to Mr. Slap, uh, my opponent, for being here tonight and giving us this opportunity to, to share our views about the, uh, the future of our state. So my top three legislative priorities, really, it's one legislative priority. It's to get our economy moving. Connecticut is a great state, but it has been struggling mightily uh, over the last uh, number of years. As I've been walking on the campaign trail, I've spoken to a number of people, spoken to my Democrat friends, and everyone realizes that we cannot continue on this path that, that we're on right now. Our underperforming economy has taken a toll on our families here in Connecticut. People that want to have a job and raise their family, and they want to live their life here and retire here. They want their kids to be able to come back to Connecticut, start their careers and have their families uh, here as well. That's under attack. That's not happening right now. There are not enough jobs to uh, cover the, the cost of living for the, the kids when they get out of college. And quite frankly, for the parents, when they look at the high cost of living, lack of opportunity, the estate tax, the gift tax, and all of the other pressures that they face, they realize that moving out of state in retirement is better off for them. And so what we need to do is we need to turn that cycle around. Essentially what we're doing is we're forcing people and businesses out of our state due to bad policy decisions that we're making in our state government. And so what we need to do to turn it around is twofold really in my view. One, we need to right size and restructure state government. It's simply too big to have a $20 billion budget for three and a half million people and to have 58,000 state employees is simply way too many. Our budget's way too big for the size of the state that we are. And second, we need to be business friendly. 
I like to, to say our approach is really pro-jobs and anti-business. Our government is clearly anti-business. And the only thing you have to do is ask just about any employer in our state, and they will tell you that. And so we need to turn that around, become pro-business, to get our Connecticut economy working again. Thank you. Derek. Great. Well, uh, thanks. It's, yeah, it's, and I've been asked this question at uh, thousands of doors all across the district in uh, every neighborhood and every street. People say, why are you running? What are your top priorities? And I say, my, uh, the reasons that I'm running uh, are three. Maggie, Zoe, and Charlie. They're my three children, of course, but they represent all the children in the 19th district. I want them to be able to attend uh, the best public schools in the state of Connecticut to keep uh, attending those schools. We need to protect our public education. I want them, when they graduate, to be able to find jobs uh, here in West Hartford and here in the state uh, of Connecticut. Um, I want them to be able to find good jobs, uh, and I want them to want to come back to Connecticut if they have left for, let's say, college. Hopefully they haven't and they've gone to the University of Connecticut, but uh, wherever they go, I want them to be able to uh, come back here because it's a vibrant, dynamic place to be. It's a progressive state with great quality of life uh, and uh, wonderful environmental resources um, as well. And I want them to be able to afford to raise a family here uh, and retire here. Um, you know, we definitely face a lot of challenges, there's no question. Um, but we need somebody, I believe, uh, in this seat uh, now more than ever who really believes uh, in the future of Connecticut, who knows how to get things done and is able to assemble a team, a coalition. Uh, I'm very proud of the support I've already secured from uh, the organization that represents a thousand teachers and educators uh, all across the district, um, from also a nonpartisan environmental group, the League of Conservation Voters. Um, I'm committed to protecting our reservoir from commercial interest and that's part of the reason that they've endorsed my candidacy as well so I'm building a team I'm excited about Connecticut's future we got a lot of work to do um, and every uh, day when I'm out there knocking on doors and meeting families I'm thinking not only of my three children uh, but the children all across the 19th district okay thank you can I follow up on that certainly you know I'm excited about our future here in Connecticut as well just not the current track that we're on it seems to to be uh, if you listen to the media stories, how the, the Democrats portray it, if you're critical of our state government, you somehow don't love our state. And that's simply not the case. We can be critical of our state government because, quite frankly, there's a lot to be critical of. Okay? We've had three decades of one-party rule in the state of Connecticut, and it's brought us to a permanent fiscal crisis. That's where we currently stand, and that, those are the words of the governor and his administration permanent fiscal crisis. We face billions of dollars of deficits. We've already gone through over a billion, and we're looking at three, four, five billion dollars of deficits coming in the next five years with no plan to tackle that issue. So I'm positive about our state. I love our state. I want to live in our state, and I do. I want to retire in our state, and I want my kids to be able to come back. And my daughter is at UConn, and I want her to be able to stay in Connecticut as well. But on this current track, kids are not staying in state. There are not enough jobs. The jobs that have been replaced after the recession are lower paying jobs. We still haven't made back the jobs that we lost during the recession. And as I said before, families and businesses are continuing to leave our state in record numbers. The only ones that stay are the ones that we pay to stay in our state. That's not economic policy. That's not the type of economic growth that we need here in our state. So I am positive about it. I'm positive about it with new leadership, new ideas, and doing it differently for the benefit of the people and the families of our state who actually deserve the opportunity and the ability to thrive in our state environment. Yeah, no, and you know, I. I agree with Chris on some of uh, his points. I mean, certainly we haven't, have not had 30 years of uh, one-party rule. Um, governor Rowland, uh, in 20 years of Republican governors, um, uh, many of whom failed to make the critical uh, investments in infrastructure and transportation infrastructure uh, that we need. We wouldn't be in this place now if it wasn't for that. Um, I do. I, I am troubled, um, honestly, by some of the rhetoric. Um, and to be to be fair, on both sides um, of the aisle, some uh, Republicans and Democrats. Um, Republicans say um, it's a terrible place. It's a terrible place to do business, um, and that's not good marketing message. 
message if we're going to want to attract businesses. Sometimes, um, you know what, there's rhetoric on the other side of the aisle too that I find troubling. I don't think we should be targeting hospitals, for instance, which um, are a great economic engine in our state and provide uh, valuable services and care. So I think um, both sides of the aisle uh, we can do better on. We need to bring people together. We need to stop the partisan sniping and we need to get down to work and grow jobs, strengthen our economy. Okay. Um, of course, what I was referring to is 30 years of legislative control, and I think we can agree that the Democrats have been in legislative control for 30 years. So I was not talking about the governors, and you understand how government works and, and the role of the legislature in crafting budget, budgets and passing laws. So that was, that was my point. Okay. I have another question on that same topic since you both mentioned it. Um, given the state's budget challenges, and I believe today's paper mentioned another 10% uh, decrease in the budget for the upcoming cycle, what do you believe is the appropriate balance of program cuts and tax increases? Start with Derek this time. Right. So Connecticut needs a balanced, affordable, sustainable budget. There's no question uh, about it. And the way we get there uh, is a uh, two ways, essentially. First, we need to continue to make budget cuts. There's no question that we're going to have to make some tough spending cuts uh, next year. And let me give you an example of one that uh, is, has worked and we need to expand. Uh, and that's creating a program that uh, saves energy costs at state buildings. It saved about $17 million last year. Uh, we should expand that to all state buildings and even to municipal buildings as well. So local taxpayers can get some of the benefit of that. That's the type of thing that we need to do, make government more uh, efficient uh, and make some tough spending cuts. Second, we need to grow the economy. We need to have more taxpayers, not exactly existing taxpayers paying more in taxes. Uh, we need to make critical investments in transportation, and that's something I'm uh, excited to talk more about as this uh, debate continues. Uh, we need to invest in IT um, as well. We need to do some of the things, um, you know, putting the foundation in place so businesses can thrive. Another thing we can do to um, uh, create jobs and help the economy as well um, is to cut bureaucracy and red tape wherever possible. Um, I have an idea uh, for a one-stop shop for small businesses that they could call uh, local government or rather state government and find out let's say, you know, what they need uh, to know as far as regulation goes and navigate uh, the alphabet soup. They should be able to have one place they call and get all the answers they need. That's going to help the spirit of entrepreneurialism uh, thrive as well. Um, you asked about the balance between uh, cuts um, and revenues. I would say there is one thing um, that we absolutely need to protect. There's many things, uh, of course, uh, that we need to be prudent about, but our local schools and public education. It's what West Hartford is all about. And uh, I know there's going to be proposals next legislative cycle to make cuts to uh, aid to cities and towns that would or could devastate uh, the quality of education in West Hartford. It could drive up property taxes. It's not the right way to go. And I will fight any proposal uh, that, um, that targets our local schools. Thank you. Chris, do you have a response? I, I do. Uh, there was a lot there to unpack. So with respect to the, the budget, the process doesn't work. So we have a couple senior members of the, the Democrat Party in Hartford that craft the budget, strong arm people to get the votes, deliver the budget to the floor of the legislature hours before a vote when people haven't read it or had an opportunity to debate it. And it simply doesn't work. Uh, and the budgets usually get passed about a minute before midnight uh, at the end of the session. And quite frankly, the people of our state deserve a lot better. Second, our budgets are unbalanced. They're unrealistic. They're one-time you know, tricks and gimmickry that's you know, part of, uh, of reaching these budgets. And that needs to change as well. Uh, when you have a uh, struggling state economy, you don't have as much revenue. And so you do have to make some cuts. And so I agree with Mr. Slap that you know, cuts are necessary and we're going to continue to make them. Uh, I don't think tax increases are an option. Quite frankly, we've had two of the largest tax increases in state history uh, during this governor's administration, and both times they failed to raise additional revenue. So to the extent folks want to see you know, tax increases, that just forces businesses and people to leave our state. So we have fewer taxpayers, less revenue coming in. You know, it, it's going to have to be through cuts and economic growth. Um, we mentioned... Um, uh, public education, hopefully that's a topic uh, we're going to get to. Um, you know, I would, I would ask Mr. Slap, would you be in favor of tax increases uh, as a way to, to balance the budget? You know, like I said before, I think that we need to focus on more taxpayers and not the existing taxpayers uh, paying 
more in taxes. Um, you know, spending cuts and growing the economy, that's what I'm focused on. I think that's the way that we're going to balance the budget. Mm -hmm. the, the, the way to get the economy, I'm sorry, it's were you okay. through? Go yeah. ahead. Um, you know, it, it's not a secret how to, to turn our economy around. The CBIA just put on a program, as they do every year, talking about the state of the Connecticut economy. And they survey hundreds of businesses, and they, they talk about what they'd like to see to make Connecticut a better place to do business, a place to actually conduct their business and grow their business. And the top four things all relate to state government. All of the things that you know, put hurdles in place of, government, of, of these companies succeeding. Mandates, regulations, fees, taxes, unpredictability, retroactive tax increases, things that companies absolutely cannot have when they're trying to run a business. A state can, when they get to the end of the year, they realize they have a budget deficit, and they say, oh, well, who are we going to shift that to? Well, maybe we'll increase the hospital tax, or maybe we'll try and tax Yale's endowment, or maybe we're going to have a retroactive tax back to the beginning of the year when businesses aren't expecting it. Those are all bad ideas. The good ideas are out there, and the Democrat one-party rule system hasn't enacted them. They know what to do, they're just not doing them. And so that's why we need change. Okay. All right, uh, let's move on. Um, Chris, next question is for you. Um, we talked about education and jobs. Um, are we matching the skills and resources um, at all our levels of education to serve the needs of students and businesses? You know, we are not. We have, we have two different school systems. We have successful schools in our suburbs under local rule and funding, and we have uncompetitive schools in our cities. Okay. Last week we had a, a supreme, uh, superior court case um, a couple weeks ago where the judge concluded that Connecticut's uh, public funding uh, for education is irrational and unconstitutional. That the achievement gap between the suburbs and the cities is so great and that the kids in the cities are learning and, and, and reading at a third grade level when they're about to graduate from high school. So they're not prepared to go off into the workforce. And so we need to bridge that gap. We need to fix the schools for those kids. We need to promote school choice to give them options. Uh, today I had the, uh, the pleasure of uh, participating in Mr. Johnson's social studies class at Hartford's Environmental Sciences Magnet School in Hartford. They asked um, some folks to come and to, to judge their debate and to uh, review their, their, their school project. And the kids were great. The debate was about drilling in Anwar and whether that was a good idea or not. The kids asked great questions and, you know, just so happy to be in school. Those are the types of things that we need to do for these kids to get them interested in education in a safe place and, and you know, prepare them for a fulfilling life when they get out of school. Uh, the second thing I'll add, I think the article that you just mentioned is it appears that the governor is looking at closing uh, vocational schools um, and taking about $50 million of funding away from uh, choice programs uh, in the next legislative year. And so that just creates more problems for trying to educate uh, these kids. Okay, same question. Are we matching the skills and resources at all our educational levels for uh, the, the needs of students and businesses? Right. No, and the short answer is no, of course not. I mean, we can do much, much more. And Chris mentioned this, uh, this judge's ruling uh, last month, and there's three parts of it that I took real offense to. First is uh, he insinuates that West Hartford is a rich town, and essentially we're getting too much funding. And I would say it's exactly the opposite, that we're being shortchanged on our education funding from the state more than perhaps uh, any other municipality uh, in the state. I mean, we don't want to see property taxes skyrocket, so we need to make sure that we get adequate funding. Uh, second, uh, the judge really targets those uh, students with special needs and seems to insinuate that um, you know they're too expensive to educate, so we should just give up on them. I find that offensive, and I think it violates federal law as well. Um, you know, and finally, uh, he targets public school teachers by saying that essentially the um, the evaluation process is a mockery. I think that's the wrong way to go. We need to partner with our public school teachers. Um, we need to help them educate our children uh, and not scapegoat them. Okay. I want to change the uh, direction a little bit and talk about the opi opioid crisis in Connecticut and, uh, and the region. Um, what are your uh, specific ideas to address 
the uh, problems concerning the opioid crisis? And Der uh, Derek, you'll go first on this one. Yeah, and you know, it's a great question. I mean, I know it's getting a lot of headlines right now, and, and it's a, an issue we have to deal with. We need more education, certainly. Um, there's a bipartisan task force, at my understanding, that's looking at it, and we need to wait and see kind of what those recommendations are. I think it brings up a larger issue, too. I mean, some of these problems sprout up uh, when uh, we have, um, you know, sluggish uh, recovery and job growth. So we need to keep our foot on the gas as far as uh, growing jobs. Uh, we need to, uh, as I mentioned this before, uh, reducing red tape wherever possible, making uh, critical investments in infrastructure, um, uh, and really making sure that we have a trained, skilled workforce. That's going to help the economy, uh, and it's going to help uh, issues like this, uh, uh, this drug problem that you mentioned. Okay. Chris? Prevention, education, and opportunity. Basically, try and you know, take the issue off the table uh, and to help these people get off their addiction and lead, you know, positive lives. Okay. Uh, would, uh, can I check with our timers, please? Are we okay on time? Okay. We have time for another question? Okay. Um, given the large rate increases in health insurance and the fiscal strugg struggles of Connecticut's co-op plan, Healthy Connecticut, should Connecticut take a larger role in ensuring the affordability of health insurance for its residents? Uh, we'll go to Chris on this one. Well, the cost of health insurance is is largely a national problem. Here in Connecticut, we make it even more expensive by having a slew of mandated benefit coverages that forces up the, the cost of insurance. As you mentioned at the state level, you know we have insurance companies that are removing themselves from the exchange. Healthy CT is um, struggling financially, and they've been told by the state to stop enrolling members. And so. As a bigger picture, we need to look back at the Affordable Care Act and say, is this really doing what it's supposed to do? And, and two, at the state level, quite frankly, we don't have the money to add to these programs to try and solidify it. We're actually out of money. And so that's what happens when you have a slow economy and you haven't planned for these types of issues. And so that's one of the reasons why we've seen the imposition of the, the hospital tax um, and it's turned upside down. So our hospitals now are paying more than they're receiving in uh, benefits from the state, uh, which I think is a bad idea. If I, I just follow up on that, I yeah. think uh, we absolutely need to uh, increase accessibility. We need to reduce cost as well. And I, I've knocked on many doors, uh, as I mentioned, all summer and met many doctors uh, in our district. And one uh, issue that they brought up was the uh, decreased Medicaid reimbursement rates. And they said, you know what, um, they, don't, they don't mind. In fact, they you know, enjoy treating uh, uh, Medicaid uh, patients. Uh, but in some cases, they have to stop because they're losing so much money. And of course, it's bad for those on Medicaid, too, because it's harder to find services. Um, so I'd like to see us increase the Medicaid reimbursement rate. It's going to be better for uh, the health care providers, and it's going to be better for those who are uh, receiving health care as well. Okay. It, it would be if we could afford it. Um, yes. All right. Um, we have um, used our time up for the question period. Uh, we are now going to move to closing statements. Um, order of response was again chosen by, um, by lottery, and uh, Derek is going to uh, give his statement first. Great. Well, thank you very much, and thanks uh, for moderating. Um, you know, when I've uh, spoken with thousands of people all across the district, uh, sometimes they'll ask me, well, why, why are you doing this? Um, and I say, you know, it really starts with my upbringing. Uh, my father was a minister. Uh, my mother uh, is a, a nurse right now, a geriatric nurse. And they, they brought me up uh, to uh, value hard work, um, honesty, and, and public service. It wasn't um, a choice of if we were going to give back. Um, the question is how uh, we were going to find a way uh, to help the uh, community. Um, I feel like uh, my whole professional life, I've been uh, preparing for this. Um, I was involved in journalism for nearly a decade, and I really enjoyed giving a voice to those people who didn't have one and helping to enfranchise folks. Uh, and then I worked in state and local government. Uh, I worked on uh, issues like um, universal pre-K uh, and expanding it um, and hoping to, uh, uh, to close the achievement gap. Uh, we created a, a job training program for veterans who were returning from the Iraqi war and helped small businesses as well. Um, I'm very proud of the coalition and the team that I've built. Um, like I said, teachers all across the district, more than 1,000 educators, um, this uh, nonpartisan uh, environmental group uh, were committed to protecting the reservoir from commercial interest. That's something that came up in the interview process. And they believe in me, the teachers believe in me, business leaders believe in me, and I hope that you'll believe in me and vote uh, for me on uh, November 8th. Thank you very much for your time. Chris. Libby, thank you very much. Our great state is struggling.
And I don't think our elected officials understand the urgency that we face. Billions and billions of dollars in the coming years are going to have to be cut, and we don't know where we're going to cut them, okay? These are going to be very difficult cuts. The Democrats, as I've said during this debate, have controlled the legislature for the last 30 years. We've seen their ideas and their visions at work. They're the same visions and ideas that have brought us to this point. The problem in Connecticut is we are not rowing together. We're rowing in one direction with the permanent government class doing and saying what they need to say to remain in power in office in Hartford. And then we have the families and the businesses rowing in a different direction, trying to find opportunity here in our state and trying to be successful. We can only fix our state if we work together to fix it. For too long, our government has been controlled by one party rule, and we are long overdue for a change. So what do we do? So when you consider, when you go into the voting booth, who you're going to vote for, are you going to vote for the same old, the same ideas, the same people to give us the same results? Or are you going to say, it's time for new ideas, new leadership, a new vision for the future of Connecticut? We, the families and the businesses of Connecticut, deserve so much better. It can be so much better. Our government knows what needs to be done to turn things around, and they're not doing it. And so we need a change to affect what we need to have here in Connecticut as a positive economic engine, not government control and involvement of picking winners and losers and paying $400 million to one company or $200 million to another company to stay in Connecticut. We deserve better. I want you to vote for better. Please vote for me on November 8th to represent the 19th District. Thank you. Thank you. Before closing out, I'd like to thank the candidates for joining us, as well as thanking WHCT-TV and the staff for putting on this program, and the timers and staff of the League of Women Voters of Greater Hartford. We encourage everyone to come out and vote on November 8th. Absentee ballots are available at the town clerk's office should you need them, and we encourage you to contact them if, if need be. Good night. <laughs>